Okay. So um, before I get a clicker, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm not from Canada, if that's what you think my accent reveals. Uh, I'm Swedish, which I guess is, you know, similar altitude <laughs> as, uh, as Canada, other side of the world. I've been out in the Bay Area for the past 10 years. Um, uh, always been in love with technology and innovation from, you know, I was the kid who drove my parents nuts by dissembling the VHS uh, tape recorder and, you know, uh, blowing things up in the backyard and then assembling it again. Um, so I've always been an engineer. I started developing and coding when I was eight and uh, uh, like to think I'm still a good developer, but I guess my engineers, they don't think so anymore. So I'm actually locked out of their repository, so I'm not allowed to commit any code anymore. Um, so let's see here. So today I'll yes, tell you the story about Scout and what are some of the key learnings. How did we end up raising 22 million from Andreessen Horowitz? And uh, what, could, what would I tell myself if I could travel back in time? Uh, you know, each year that goes on, I'm like, boy, if I could travel back one year and talk to that stupid guy, you know, to avoid all these mistakes. And so I've sort of assembled the past seven years' experience into some key learnings for me that might or might not be agreeable or pertain to all of you, but that's at least what I would tell myself if I could travel back in time. Okay. So a little bit about the company. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, uh, 130 people. We have so far... Uh, garnished over 50 million installs all over the world. We're building a network for meeting people. So it's really like Facebook, but the fund fundamentals is not people you know, but people you don't know. And we're big in areas from uh, Middle East to Korea to uh, uh, Hong Kong is one of our biggest cities. New York City is big. Uh, so it's truly a global phenomenon that we've, uh, that we've sort of encountered in what we built. We started seven years ago, which is uh, quite early, uh, there were no app stores and so forth, and so it was quite challenging. We have some other products as well. We have one group messaging app called Fuse and a nightlife app called Nixter. And our number one mission for the company is to connect people who don't know each other, and currently we're doing 500 million new connections all over the world, uh, which is the number one North Star that we build uh, the rest of the company around, is how many new connections we can enable. Okay, so a little bit about the story of how we got here. Uh, so we started in 2007. Uh, I was an engineer at VMware uh, in Palo Alto, which I'm sure most of you are aware what company that is. It's an enterprise company. Uh, I'd never built anything in consumer, uh, and I thought it was a great idea to get together with two other guys who never built anything in the consumer market either. And uh, we looked at Facebook at that time, and they had nothing in mobile nothing at all. They didn't even have a mobile web solution. And we said, boy, you know, with this fancy Motorola device I brought with me from Europe that had, you know, one of these pens you could tap with, and it actually had a GPS. Uh, actually also alcohol related, that's my dinner with, with Matt here, was up in Lake Tahoe snowboarding. And uh, with this beautiful, pristine view, I told my friend who uh, was one of the co-founders of the company, wouldn't it be super cool if I can take a picture of this, uh, what we're seeing right now, and share it with my friends who are sitting at home being bored at their computer. So that's sort of how we started it. And uh, we thought location and mobile was gonna be a big thing. Uh, back then, you know, when you snapped a photo and it suddenly showed up on someone's screen on, in the web browser, they were like, wow, how did you do that? Like, really, you took a photo with your phone and you put it on, on, a, uh, on the online? Wow, that is crazy. Uh, we struggled, I would say, for the first three, four years. You know, we were trying to raise capital. Uh, uh, surprisingly, or surprisingly not, the number one feedback we got from venture capitalists was mobile, you know. This is weird. Uh, you can't type on a mobile phone. Who's gonna chat with other people on a cell phone? It's barely usable. Uh, so half the presentations was about the mobile opportunity. And most VCs back then, they didn't get it. They were like, no, we don't know. Uh, because remember, uh, things have been moving quite fast the past seven years. And uh, back then, it was not clear that mobile would be a big thing for everyone. For me, it was. Uh, so, you know, we 
we raised some angel money, and uh, we were not able to raise any venture capital, which meant we had to go through some real struggles that involved uh, big credit card debts to you know, uh, no salary for the first 18 months of the company. Uh, we were able to build it up to 10 people, and then we couldn't raise more money, so we had to go down to three people, and we were like, it's game over. But then it actually started uh, to, uh, to accelerate, which was very, very, very exciting. So 2011 was a real breakout year, and that was the year when we decided to move from being just a social network around location and mobile to build a global network for meeting people around location and mobile. Um, that, of course, in conjunction with Apple, the App Stores, Android, and being able to ride that wave, uh, which I think is still being built at a very explosive pace, maybe not in the US, but if you look at the international market, we're still able to really um, uh, be part of that massive, massive growth, which really is the biggest technology adoption in recorded human history, is smartphones. So uh, we were fo forced to focus on revenue, which you know, to fund operations. You know, we're not a company that makes money just to make money. We make money so we can fund the vision of what we're building. And uh, believe it or not, once you're profitable, it's much easier to raise money from venture capitalists. So uh, in 2012, we raised 22 million from Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz. And um, I'll go through a little bit about that experience and the slide deck we used to raise that money. So a little bit about um, Andreessen Horowitz, which I, you know, they raised around 5 billion. They started five years ago. Uh, they have companies such as Facebook, Pinterest, uh, Sulili and you know, other great companies, they see around 3,000 warm leads every year. So you can't just show up there and say, hey, I'm Christian from Sweden, and I'm going to raise money from you. You have to ha know a CEO in their portfolio or know uh, uh, someone who's tight with the firm, basically. And if you can get in there, then you have 2,999 other uh, companies in a year that you compete with. And they make around 40, 50 investments a year. Um, so, you know, it's five times harder than getting into Stanford. <laughs> so, you know, you look at this and you look at venture financing in general, the funnel is extremely, extremely steep. Um, so, obviously, you have to make a deep and profound impression and have some luck uh, to actually get uh, financed. So, I, I had met with Mark and Reason two years before we raised the money. And uh, at that point, and I was probably, uh, you know, we had no idea what to do with the company. We were like, we need to raise a million dollars, and we don't know if this can be a big franchise. Maybe it can, maybe it cannot, but we need some more runway to figure out these different bits and pieces. And uh, he basically said, look, once you know you can build or want to build a big franchise, get back to me. So two years later, I pinged him. Uh, I sent an email, it's like, hey Mark, you know, I think we're onto something and we can build a big franchise. And I got the response back in three minutes. So uh, that's something with Mark that's amazing. He responds to emails in three minutes. I don't know how that's physically possible, but uh, bam, let's meet on Thursday. And uh, so I went to Andreessen Horowitz's offices and you're always nervous when you're going to go pitch VCs. And your team, they know that, oh, you got this meeting, you like, they have a lot, very high expectations. And every time you come back empty-handed, it's the same thing like, oh no, he screwed up again. <laughs> and so I came there and I was a bit early and they had the reception. Uh, there was some student uh, conference or something. And of course there, were, there was uh, uh, whiskey there. So I had a shot of whiskey and uh, it's like crap, you know. I'm actually starting to feel this whiskey a bit. Maybe I should balance it with an espresso. But that turned out to be the winning combination. Uh, you know, call it doping or not, but hey, it's, uh, uh, it worked really, really well. So I went up to his office, and uh, he had this 80-inch huge TV. And we had a 3D uh, visualization, like a, a globe, really, of uh, an Earth globe that showed real-time interaction on Scout. And it was spinning, really nice. 3D thing. So all I showed it was I plugged that thing in, and you can see engagement all over the world. 
And I also showed him this slide, which is two years old, which is uh, uh, you know, the hockey stick curve you want to see. So I only have four metrics, which is daily active users, messages per day, people connections, and revenue per day. Um, so I think this is the reason we raised the money. You don't need anything else than traction and to prove that you have a, a huge market that you're addressing. Um, but without this, you know, they wouldn't put any money in, in me because I'm not a known entity, and that's the hardest part. Next company, maybe I'll have more leeway. I can say, hey, you know, it's Christian again, and uh, you know, last time it went pretty well, so can you just believe in me and put some money in the company, and then I can start building. But as a first-time entrepreneur, there is no way that you can just show up with an idea. You have to have some serious traction to, to raise a growth round. Um, so the way I, uh, so how do you structure a pitch deck? Uh, and I think I've become a master of it, uh, and it's one of the most tedious tasks. Uh, and pitching sucks, but you have to learn to love it, right? You're going to all these meetings with all these VCs, and all they say, no, 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 or they say, I love you, you're great, fantastic, get back when you have more traction, okay define traction and you try to like what do you mean traction ah you know traction get more traction because it's not your job to say no I'll never talk to you again because what if this is the next snapchat or the next scout like I, I don't want to be the guy who shut the door indefinitely and uh, uh, so that's something you learn very quickly with raising money is be disciplined about how many meetings you take with them so for me I set it at three and I tell them look I'll do three meetings and if you don't have something significant after that, I'm not going to meet with you anymore because it's, they have all the time in the world to meet with you. And I've had, uh, in the early years of Scout, you know, some investors I met with 15 times. And they're like, yeah, some more traction. I'm like, come on, show me the money. Like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, so the pitch deck that we used was just 12 slides. And first we went in with traction. So that was really the, that hockey stick. Um, uh, slide that you saw, and then we had a snapshot. We showed what's our run rate, uh, we showed um, our growth rate the past year, which was 10x. Basically, every metric we had was 10x bigger than a year earlier. Having that said, we started from a small base, but it looked really good to come in 10x, 10x on everything. And uh, then you need to explain to them the value proposition. I don't think you need to educate investors about the market. They know it. Like. Uh, they know if markets are big, if, you know, who are the players, extremely well educated. So I just cut all of that stuff out and just focus on what's the core value we're bringing to the world. And then what's our plan to uh, 10x this company from where it is today. So the growth plan is obviously very important. And, uh, and the last thing I put was the team. So you can structure the pitch decks differently. Some people start with the team. Uh, for me, we ended with the team, uh, which I think, you know, People argue you start with it or end with it. I don't care. It just felt better to have it by the end. So a simple deck that just shows what we have today, what's our value proposition, who are, who are our users. Show that you have some insight into your data, right? Uh, slice it by geography, demographics. Show engagement numbers. Show retention numbers and so forth. And then how are you going to scale this thing? Well, who are you going to hire? Uh, where are you going to spend the money? And uh, how does the next 12 months look like? I think 12 months is a good forecast. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in three years? If, yeah, let's, uh, so I try to avoid, like you come in and say, in five years we'll be $100 million a year revenue company. You lose credibility immediately because no one knows. Um, I barely know what we're doing next month. Right? I mean, things change so quickly. So that's a bit about the deck. Do you guys have any questions about the pitching and the process, or it's all clear. You can all walk into and reason now, and you you come to me, and I'll give you an introduction, and you'll raise 22 million. What your is if you need one. We don't need to raise money, uh, so we're we're a profitable company, and uh, I think with building a company, you have to take charge of your own destination. It's extremely extremely important, and. Uh, some people argue revenue is not cool. You know, look at Snapchat and Instagram. Billion dollars and they have no revenue. It must mean that if you want to be a billion dollar company, don't make money. 
Well, uh, this we and this this thing goes in cycles. Eyeballs versus money. And uh, just last week, you had uh, some of the top VCs in the world. They came out and said, "We are very nervous about all these companies just burning through cash without a revenue model." So you, I guarantee you, for the next six to twelve months, you'll see companies who actually make money be more attractive for for that industry. It moves up and down. It, it's actually quite predictable. Um, so you know, is it healthy to burn two million, three million bucks a month? No, it's not. Right. So. Uh, controlling your own destiny is very, very important. Okay. So, as I said, I wanted to give you some of my uh, unfiltered feedback of if I could travel back in time and you know, say, hey, here are, here's the playbook or here's some advice, that would be incredible and it would have helped me. And it might not apply to everyone here, but this is uh, my take on entrepreneurship. So, first starting a company, you have to focus on passion. If you start with, I want to get rich, you'll be very disappointed. Most of us will not make any money, but we will have a lot of fun and we will end up with a big collection of credit card debts and creditors chasing us. Um, you have to start with passion and you have to find something you're passionate about that involves a hard problem in a big market if you want to build a really, really big company. Uh, you can still, there's nothing wrong with bootstrapping and I have friends who, you know, they're one developer and they're uh, sustaining their whole lifestyle, making good money by us submitting apps and doing games and whatever it might be. But if you want to build something big, what investors look for is hard problems to solve in huge markets. So, you know, Scout, you could argue is, I would say it's a medium problem to solve in the huge markets. Uh, you know, if you invent the next uh, chip that's 10 times faster than all other chips, and that's a huge market, it's very hard to solve, right? And when you start a company, please take note of this, never be cheap on legal fees. So, uh, you know, who wants to spend 10 grand on lawyers? Ooh. You know, I'd rather spend it on uh, hiring that developer or uh, doing some marketing, test marketing campaigns or something. But this is one particular thing when you start early that can come back and bite you. So for us, we were lucky, but I have many friends who've been um, bitten pretty badly by not having the early founder vesting schedules nailed down. So let's say uh, three of us start company and we say day one we get 33% each and there's no vesting and then I decide to leave. Then you guys are screwed. <laughs> Uh, so it's very important that you have uh, all the basic stuff in place, in particular with fund investing. Okay, so how do you get through the garage and seed stage phases? So we were here for four years, basically, where we were sitting at, we had some offices, but we were also sitting at my kitchen table, driving my wife nuts. <laughs> but uh, uh, you have to focus on product. And I'm a consumer guy, so I know mo that's what this will sort of uh, be around. Uh, and there might be other things in other types of businesses, but for consumer, it's all about product. There is nothing else, like nothing else can help a bad product. You can't put lipstick on, what do you say in America? Lipstick on an ugly pig. <laughs> like it doesn't work. You have to nail the product. So how do you know when you nail the product? So you spend 18 months building this incredible service and you all your friends are excited about it. You know, your mom and dad, everyone is like, wow. And every dinner you're at, people are starting to get bored of you. It's like, please stop talking about this damn product you're building. And after 18 months of that, you push the button, launch, and nothing happens. And, uh, you know, champagne is already corked up, and wow, what's happening? It happens to all of us. Nothing is going to happen. First product iteration never works. Um, but how do you know when you have it? Well, you have to start defining some core metrics. So retention is what I think the most important thing. So what's your second day, seventh day, 30 day retention? So there are some North Stars in here where you know immediately if it's gonna work or not, right? So if my second day return rate, so if all users that signed up today, if only 10% of them shows up a second day, I, you just can't work with that product. If 40% shows up, you can say, wow, you know, I can probably get it up to 60, 65 and have something that we can actually scale. So figure out the metrics and retention is the most important one. Engagement metrics, so how sticky is your product? Um, 
Facebook, they use this, they have one metric called the 5-7 rule, which is how, what percent of your users um, have used the app five days of the last seven days. And that's uh, uh, one index you can use for uh, figuring out stickiness. Daily retention is another one. So how many of your monthly active users use the app every day? So Facebook, they have around 50%. So if they have 1 billion monthly actives, they have 500 million daily actives. And that's a phenomenal uh, daily retention rate. So you know, if you're over 20%, you're really good. So growth metrics, uh, I would wait. Like you need to experiment with driving some installs and doing all that good stuff. But if you have a leaky bucket, it doesn't really matter. So do some experimental campaigns. Don't blow too much money on buying traffic from millennial in the early, early stage. Uh, later on, you will, of course. Um, you, need to see the, you need to get enough data to understand how your app behaves. And then revenue. So for us, we track ARPDAO, average revenue per user and day, LTV, and ARPU. And uh, again, I don't think like, there's no right answer for when you're going to start monetizing. Uh, be careful to be part of the hype machine and like, it's not cool to make money, so I'm not going to make money. Do whatever is right for you and your company. There's no right and wrong. And you know, if there is a trade-off that monetizing puts sort of a break on growth, then you can make an educated decision. What do I need most? I need revenue or I need more growth. And maybe you can then raise money on like, look, if I don't have revenue, I can actually grow this 100% faster than with having revenue. And then the most important thing, avoid distractions at all costs in this phase. You need to define core activities. And anything that goes outside of that, just say no. right? Um, once you have your first, first TechCrunch article, you'll start getting all these emails from all, of, all over the world, all different people. And from having sitting in the garage, and no one cares about you at all, from getting all this unsolicited interest, you'll start going. You'll start going to conferences. You'll start meeting with all these people. But you don't need that in the beginning. In the beginning, all you need is to focus on product. Um, and uh, so that's something I was notoriously bad at. You know, I, uh, anyone who wanted to meet, I'd meet. And I wasted a lot of time. Um, and nothing actually ended up in anything. For a consumer product, there's no partnership that's going to help you grow the company. It's all about your product. OK, so scaling the company. Uh, so financing, look. Uh, I was definitely in this camp as well. I was always chasing, like, what do we need to prove to raise venture capital? Instead of thinking, what does the company need to actually scale? And venture capital might not be the answer for everyone. Uh, you have to understand that once you raise venture capital, you give away a chunk of your company, and you give away uh, uh, power in the company. right? And raising capital, you have to deliver. Mark Andreessen did not put 22 million in uh, Scout so that he's going to get 30 million back. Right? He wants to have 500 million back. That's the model. Like They need to have 10, 20x uh, on the investment. If we return 5x, maybe they're happy. But that's not the business they're in. Uh, they're in the business of finding these unicorns uh, that can return the entire fund, basically. So once you, raise, once you raise a big round from VC, understand that now you're going um, to the big leagues. Like you're really swinging for, I shouldn't try this uh, you know, American sports analogies, but I'll try swinging for the fence. Uh, very, very important. Uh, so don't raise, and look, you're building up um, a liquidation stack as well. So once you raise money, uh, who gets the money back out first? When and if you sell the company, well, it's the investors. Like, you're building up a stack that needs to be covered. And uh, what could be a hugely successful exit for you, uh, let's say you own 90% of the company and sell it for 15 million, most people consider that an absolute slam dunk. That's incredible. But if you raise VC money uh, and you sell the company for 100 or 200 million, it's not a slam dunk. So for us, bootstrapping an angel, and I think we're close to bankruptcy four times <laughs> until, we, until we came out on the other end. Any questions about that? OK. Uh, you mentioned that even during 2007, 2010, that was a uphill battle for you. So what was the kind of traction you needed to be able to get your first uh, angel investment? 
So for so angel investors, it's easier to pitch an idea. We had some growth. We had, I think we had like 20,000 a month in revenue or something like that. And we had some numbers. Uh, I was lucky that my mentor, uh, a Swedish guy, he put like 500K of his own money into the company. And that was probably not the smartest move. Uh, he, uh, now, now he looks like a smart guy, but back then it was a big, big bet. So I was just very lucky to have him to sort of finance the first first round there because the uh, uh, it wasn't sustainable like we were I mean I was broke basically you know I was a student un until I came here like Arnold all I had was two suit bags and moved to America and uh, there was no uh, my family never had any money and there was just no way for me to finance it myself than, than credit card debt but that only goes so far eventually they do start chasing you and want you know, want you to make the payments um, but angels, um, so look, good news is right now there is a lot of angel money. Uh, there is a ton of it. And also good news is everyone wants to be an angel investor. Sounds great at the cocktail party. Oh, I'm an angel investor. Oh, yeah, I'm in that company, that company, that company. Uh, and there are a lot of companies who have had very successful uh, private financings where there's stock buybacks and there is successful IPOs and also acquisitions where you know, I think just Twitter generated over a thousand dollar millionaires, right? And uh, chances are a big portion of those want to put 25 or 50 or 100K in companies here and there. Uh, so there's a lot of angel money out there. And I would almost argue there is too much because what happens is uh, there are, the bar for starting companies have become quite low. Uh, and there are companies who are being started that maybe shouldn't be started in a more competitive uh, market for raising money. So what happens now is you have a serious A crunch, which we talk about a lot. We, you, we can all raise angel money, but then to raise from, from uh, venture capital becomes very, very hard. Because there's so many companies now, so the funnel is even, the top of the funnel is even broader, and there's still not that many more serious, serious A companies being funded. So same thing there, maybe you raise a million, but make sure that you can sustain it. I see way too many companies who raise a million, uh, pay themselves salaries that are too high, and they assume they can raise the next round, and 12 months later, they belly flop and it's game over. So just be careful there with, with it. But there's a lot of angel money, so. All right, uh, people. So what's the most important asset for a company? It's, it's people, of course. And I want to spend some time talking about this because it is very, very important. And it all starts with the founders. Uh, you can't hack or retrofit culture. So, you know, if it's okay to drink at work, if the founders drink at work, everyone will drink at work. You know, that's just the way it works. You should not underestimate HR. That's something, um, you know, when you start a company, you think legal, finance, HR, ugh, like, really? That's not what I signed up for, and why would it be important? HR is one of those things that will wreck your company. Once you hit around 50 people, you need HR. And you know, it will upset the early employees when you present the employee handbook, please sign, and you know, all these policies, but you definitely need it. Always hire people smarter than yourself. It might seem like no brainer, but and this doesn't just go for founders, but for everyone. You always have to hire people smarter than yourself. Uh, the number one job for a CEO of a company is to build a team and set the strategy for the company. But if you don't have the team, you can't scale. So uh, for me, you know, 20, 30% of my time is just focused on recruiting uh, across the entire company, really. Two senior people. So, When you're early and you have no pro you have you have a product, you have some ideas, you don't have a lot of traction, and you think like, wow, you know, my investor pitch deck would look so much better if I had this senior Microsoft guy uh, in the rooster. You know, either as full-time employee or hey, this guy will join once we raise the money, or this person is an advisor to us. I'd be a bit careful there in making sure that uh, they know what they're signing up for and that you know what what they can deliver. Because in the early years, it's all about execution. There is, not, there's, 
there is not much strategy, quite frankly, and there's not much managing teams. You have a small tiger team, and everyone just has to deliver and execute every day. Um, with advisors as well, one question you will get, you build up this advisor rooster in your pitch deck, and they say, wow, you have all these people who made a lot of money advising your company, so how much did they invest? And if you say, oh, they might, they're thinking about investing, okay. So advisors are not investing, that doesn't look good uh, uh, on the company either. The way I hire people, I test them on uh, four different things, and in falling order, what I believe is the most important is, do they actually believe in your vision? So for Scout, have they tried the app? <laughs> like, that's a good first start. And you'd be shocked how many candidates come in and it's like, yeah, I haven't tried the app yet. And I was like, okay, like, let's just end it here. I don't want to waste your time or my time. Do they truly believe in the vision that connecting people that don't know each other is a good thing? So that I test very hard for. Number two is, are they a great fit? We have a no asshole rule, no politics rule. Like, uh, it doesn't matter if you are a nice guy and then become asshole, we'll fire you. Like, we have no tolerance for assholes in this company. So are you a great, um, can you be a great team member and be part of the team that has a family feel? You know, we're not a family because we actually replace people. Uh, but it has that very tight feel because we all work 80 to 90 hours a week together and you know, I have three kids uh, that I barely see because I'm with my team and they better be nice people so in 20 years we can actually have a shot of whiskey and an espresso and laugh about the experience and still be good friends. And that is very important to me. Then of course we need money. Like San Francisco is an expensive city, ridiculously expensive right now and we should pay market salary. Like uh, we have the capability of doing so, of course we should. And then the, on the fourth reason why you should join is equity. So everyone who contributes to the company should of course be part of a potential big payday. But if you flip these things and you recruit people who are only in for a quick win, they will all leave the company once you hit some resistance. And all companies, Twitter, Facebook, Scout, whoever it is, will go through growth phases and then you will have flat. Sometimes you have even negative growth Sometimes you have a big lawsuit from FTC, or you have something else, and this competitor launching this product that takes your market share. You need warriors who are willing to build. So like, I love recruiting people when the company is uh, not growing, when we've had three months of no growth. And I'll be transparent, I'll tell them, look, we're not growing. Like, this is, you know, it's stressing the hell out of me. We're not growing right now. So I try to, downplay how good the company is doing. And if they're still willing to join the company, I know that they're actually in it because of the vision. Anyone can join Pinterest when they're growing like this, right? You join, you get 0.3% uh, of the company's guaranteed money. Uh, but to join a company that's on the decline and say, look, I'm gonna help turn this around, that takes a different type of person. And those are the type of people that, that I screen for when I interview. And the last bullet, uh, also when scaling, so we actually did this mistake. We went from 10 people to 140 in 12 months. That's too fast, <laughs> right? So uh, hire managers and incentivizing them to hire people quickly is eventually gonna be uh, disastrous for you. So we had to clean that up. We actually had to uh, do some restructuring because we hired way too fast. We didn't have, uh, strong enough middle management that could get all these people uh, to be very productive. So be careful with how fast you scale up as well. Um, marketing budgets are very easy to cut. Uh, people budgets is pain in the ass to cut. Like, be very careful. As you build up the cost structure on people, it's very, very hard. Uh, no one wants to go through rips. It's, uh, it's not, and you know, it's your responsibility to not take the company to that position. Okay, so product. So my product philosophy is, and this uh, changes every year, <laughs> but uh, data design and gut feel. Uh, we're a data-driven company. We do a lot of multivariate testing. We tune and tweak. I love design. We hire the best designers that we could possibly find. And you should never forget your gut feel. In the early days of every company, it's all gut feel and maybe some design, and then later you get more sophisticated. But these three things need to play well together. And what I've learned is that there are actually no silver bullets. 
every entrepreneur I know, uh, they're always talking about the next release. Oh, the next release, I have this killer feature that's gonna make us grow. And then they launched that one and it didn't work out. And oh, the next release, I have this five new features that's gonna make us grow. And they just keep going, going, going. We were the same way. And it doesn't work. Like, you will never find that one silver bullet. They're only dead bullets. So you have what you have. You have to build a product that's um, rich enough to actually prove out if it works or not. And then it's all about iteration. Now, I throw in a lot of uh, 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 wild cards still, like, because I love building features. But you have to be disciplined and understand that the next feature is not going to be what, what really makes it. It's about the small iterations. Of course, you have to obsess over reviews. Um, every great product people, they read the App Store reviews every day. They go into, log into support email, and they read support emails every day. They learn how to sniff out signals. You know, maybe there are bad bugs. Maybe there is some feedback. Maybe something we need to change. So listening to your customer is extremely important. Um, and also talking to users. So I, I talk every day to 10 new people on Scout, every day. And uh, you just have to do that. If you don't have um, the connection with your community and your product, you will never be a winner. And one thing that's, my team is not here, so I'll just say it, they might not agree. I'm the best QA engineer in the company. I can find bugs no one else can find. And this has been perplexing to me because as a CEO, I shouldn't sit testing the app all the time and find all these bugs. But it turns out that this is pretty common. Like CEOs and founders throughout many, many companies, doesn't matter how big they are, they are still the best QA people because you know the product inside out. You've been obsessing over it for the past five, seven years. No one else can compete with that. So uh, don't feel down if you're the best QA person in your company. Maybe that's actually your, how you can add the most value. And then, of course, looking at the marketplace. What other apps are out there? Uh, I always download every new app, every app that gets featured by Google and Apple. You know, try them out. Figure out how their uh, engagement flows look like, how's the onboarding process. Uh, you can learn so much by us seeing what's out there. And then growth, uh, so it can be engineered, viral or paid. So if you want to buy traffic, I'm sure there's some people in here who can help you. Uh, viral is uh, harder but doable. Engineered, with engineered I mean SEO. Um, can you build some type of tools that can help spread your, um, your products on Tumblr or Twitter or whatever it might be? So for us, we, uh, we do paid acquisition, uh, but most of our growth is organic. And when it comes to building networks, you definitely have strong network effects, which means you know, Scout with one user is not that fun. Right? Scout with a million users suddenly is a lot of fun. Scout with 10 million users is even more fun. So you get the benefits of having a network. And what we've seen from that as well is you have something called a DAU draft. So if you have 5 million active users every day, obviously they talk about your product. They might be sitting in a bar using your product. Someone shows up, hey, what's that app? Like you actually get growth from just having a big network without doing anything. So once you hit that tipping point, it sort of starts growing on itself, which is very beautiful. Data, data, data. For growth, you have to have strong data scientists and strong data practices. Uh, in particular, if you do paid growth, right? If I spend five bucks on buying a user, how much money do I make back, right? If you have an arbitrage opportunity, do it, right? The same thing here. Some people in the market, they say it's not cool to buy traffic, like the product needs to be so good that uh, it should grow on its own. I think that's bullshit. Like, if you can buy traffic uh, and you have some ROI, just do it. Uh, do whatever it takes to grow. But again, don't focus too much effort here until you have the retention numbers. Uh, the faster you push in the bucket, if it's leaking, the faster it leaks. Uh, so figure out how to plug the holes in the bucket before you go aggressive here. And then growth hacking. Um, so immature platforms are always vulnerable to growth hacking and it's always very tempting to do. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs who do it. I would not recommend doing it. It will come back and bite you in the midterm. So you'll see companies who are growing up the charts and they're doing SMS spam. Okay, 
good for them, but they will be fined and sued by FTC uh, before the year is over, or by you know a class action lawsuit. It will happen, so you know, be careful with uh, getting too enthusiastic with growth hacking. And the final slide. Uh, this is my ancestors, the Vikings. So uh, it takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, but it's totally worth it. Um, for me, I'm unemployable, so I have no other choice than to actually go ahead and build a company. Uh, but it's never going to be easy. You learn to take punches, and it doesn't matter if you're two people or 100 people, there is always new hairballs around the corner. You know, The key employee who is quitting, um, the lawsuit just came in, a frivolous lawsuit, or the new competitor who came out with this monster product that's going to kill you. Uh, it never ends, so you have to really appreciate the struggle. And there is nothing glamorous about being an entrepreneur at all. It might look like that when you read the news, and you know, and particular now it's becoming almost like LA. I feel like Silicon Valley, where all these rock stars and you know, champagne is flowing. But that's not reality. All entrepreneurs I know are extremely hardworking and committed, and it's extremely, extremely stressful. So you have to really like that to. Uh, uh, to survive. And um, we should also not forget about timing, right? So um, timing, I think, equals luck. And it's not often talked about. So how many of these companies that are successful today are successful due to timing? I think a lot of them. Uh, could I start Scout today? I don't think so. Uh, if I were to start from zero today, there's no way. We were a bit too early, but we had, you know, better be a bit too early than be too late. Um, for every Snapchat there, which you might look and say, wow, two guys, Stanford dorm room, and boom, $10 billion. Yeah, but you, know, you can also win the lottery. Uh, it's uh, how many dorm room hackers do you think there are right now in the world sitting there hacking away, releasing apps? So it becomes sort of a numbers game, and eventually something will hit. And uh, I try to avoid looking at those anomalies and say, oh, that's unfair. That's very unfair that these guys just launched an app and it just, bam, just took off. When I've been working here for years and nothing happens. Just ignore these negative signals and just stay focused on what you're doing and understand uh, there is a good, fair portion of luck in here. And um, the last thing I would say is failing sucks. So that's, uh, uh, in Bay Area there's this thing where, well, failing is good for you, it's another battle scar. I start a company, and if I fail, I'll still be able to raise more money. And you know that might be true, but you shouldn't have that as sort of a lifeline and say, "Well, you know, if I fail, nothing happens." Failing absolutely sucks, and uh, I would never want to fail this company. And I think that's also why Mark and Reason put money in the company because they saw we spent four years in hell, you know, having fun, but it was really, really hard. And he said, "Look." If you can do this without us, I know you can do it with us because your life will suddenly be so much easier. So uh, never giving up, I think, is very important. And we wouldn't be here today if we, if we did give up in the early years, even though it was close a few times, I'll admit. But, uh, so yeah, that's the, the scout story and some, some advice there. Hopefully it's worth something. Do you guys have any questions? You know, I think there, okay, so was it easier with Mark's money? Um, so I think, so this is my opinion. I think 80% of all VCs are actually gonna be negative value to your company. Uh, you know, they're gonna be bullies on the board, they're gonna force you to do product decisions with products they don't even understand, and yes, not good. I have friends who have been pushed out by their board, uh, which must be terrible, right? You started this company, it's your baby, it's everything, it's your career, and they come in and they push you out. 10% uh, of VCs, I would say, are neutral. They don't do any harm, any good. And then 10% will really, really help your company. And then Reason Horowitz, definitely in that 10%. So for me, I have full autonomy. Uh, I can do whatever I want. They have never pushed any decisions on me. Uh, they have built something that's unique in the VC world, and that's an operational team that is there to support the CEO. So for me, first time CEO, I don't have the Rolodex, 
I never hired and fired VPs. Uh, I've never built an HR department. There's so many things that you haven't done. And they understand that, but they're betting on you as the founder, and they build up a support network and structure around you. So for instance, uh, networking. I don't have uh, the Rolodex to go in and meet with CEOs from big companies and whatever it might be. So they do uh, uh, corporate briefing days where uh, if I want to meet with a uh, CEO of whatever big company, we, I can meet with him or her. And uh, HR, they help you with HR, they help you with recruiting, they help you with a lot of things. So, you know, for me, I think it's the best sort of MBA program you could ever attend. And something that's also the, uh, the strength of Enrique Horowitz is that none of their general partners are actually VCs. They never hired VCs to be general partners. They only hired people who have built companies themselves, which is very, very uh, comforting for me because we can relate to each other. All of them have been in the same position I'm in, and they've struggled with similar issues, but maybe in different formats. And it's easy to relate than having a money guy who never built a company trying to tell you what to do or understand the stress you're going through. So uh, I would say it's definitely been way easier, even though it's not easy. It's been uh, very nice to have these guys in your camp. Uh. Earlier, you talked about pacing. Uh, since you got funded, how does your growth metric chart look now? And I know you have full autonomy, but still, if VC wants results, and ultimately, how do they push you and have that affected your pacing since 2012? Uh, I think, if anything, they might say, hey, slow down a bit. <laughs> um, when they do investments, they look at it on a 10 year. There's like, everything is in 10 years. Uh, you hire your VP of engineering, you're going to have for the next 10 years. Like, they look at things on, they think, and I agree that great companies get built over a long period of time. It's not going to be, 18 months, 24 months, then you flip the company. They really, really want you to stick with the company and grow it. And the end goal is not to just, you know, cash out quickly, but it's to build something really, really substantial that can change uh, and touch a lot of people's lives in the world. So um, growth is... Uh, is definitely there. We have not uh, added headcount as aggressively as before. I think we have a team that's great now. Like we have uh, 130 people, and I don't feel that we need to add more people right now. And you know, you look at companies like WhatsApp, they had 50 people. Instagram, 14 people. Now we're a different beast since we monetize, and we, you know, the operations are different from what they have. But uh, you know, there's only one way to go, and that is up. <laughs> so. Retention ben benchmarks on like second day retention, seven day retention, and so forth? Or like as you started to grow, how did you see the retention change over time as your product got better? When did you feel good about retention? What was that number? So I think um, second day retention, you need, to, you need to strive to get over 60%. Um, third day retention, you need to have over 30%. And that's from an install. Uh, not the user, but an actual install. So typically you lose most in the beginning of the funnel. So you lose, you know, half the people who install the app might not actually sign up. And then half the people who signed up might not come back a second day. So it's very hard to grow something if you don't have more than 30% 30, uh, 30 day retention. And even then it's gonna be quite hard. Um, but you should also look at engagement numbers, like how many minutes per day are they using your app? I think 20 minutes it's a pretty good minimum. Because um, that end of day when you're going to start monetizing is the usage that you will monetize in some shape or form. Uh, More questions? Uh, OK.